Welcome to everybody who's watching us live or um, watching this recording. My name is Audrey Cooper. I'm the editor-in-chief of WNYC Public Radio in New York City. And I, I don't know about you, but if you are anything like me, I love to read and I have ever since I was a little girl. And I always tell people I knew I was going to do something with with words and with maybe books or uh, eventually it became newspapers. And I've always loved to read and learn things that way. And so I am so excited that we have three amazing women to talk to us today about careers in the literary arts. And um, I'm really excited for this conversation because we have three women in very different careers because there are a lot of different ways that you can get involved in the literary arts. And I am going to ask if I could introduce them, but I think they can talk for themselves and this would be a much better way to get into what they do in each of their different careers. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. But before we get to that point, I want to remind you that you can ask us questions. You can put them in the chat. You can send them to us other ways directly. It doesn't matter, but we wanna hear your questions and I'll ask them as, as they come through. Otherwise, We'll get started, and I think um, let's start. Let's start with you, Jennifer. Um, I know a lot about you because we've known each other for a very long time, longer than probably either of us wants to admit. But can you tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, and what you do for a living now? Hi, thanks so much, Audrey. I'm so excited to be here with all of you and to hear from these other remarkable panelists. Um, my name is Jennifer Torres. And I am an author. I write for young readers. So I write picture books, which would be, um, you know, books with pictures that typically maybe a grown up would read aloud to you. Um, chapter books, and those are books for people who are just beginning to read independently, and middle of grade novels. And then those are books that are mainly um, like for, for readers in third to maybe sixth, seventh grade. Um, and I love all of them. So, I have been lucky that in my career, I've gotten to do the two best jobs in the world. Um, I started as a newspaper reporter. I worked for Audrey, in fact, for a little while, which makes me even luckier. Um, I loved being a reporter. It was one of the best times I can imagine um, having on a job. And now I get to continue storytelling and exploring um, people's experiences through fiction. So um, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Johanna, um, tell us what it is that you do. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for having me, for having me today. Um, I am a literary agent and I started working in publishing uh, 20 something years ago now. Uh, I started as, a, as an agent, which an agent, what we do, we, re, we represent writers. Then I worked at Simon & Schuster as an as a executive editor for nearly 15 years. And three, three and a half years ago, I went back to uh, agenting. I'm, original, I'm originally from Ecuador. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. And uh, Stephanie, what, what is it that, what do you do? Hi, I'm Stephanie Burke. I am a, an editor. So what Johanna just talked about doing as part of her job for 15 years, that is what I do. So oftentimes people think this means I fix commas and it is not what I do. I, um, if, if people want to write books and have a good book idea, I work with them to figure out what that idea should be and what, how to make that happen and what the, like, what the structure and outline should be and how to publish it. And, and then as they write, working on revisions. And I will say I am not like Audrey because not, I was a huge book nerd and loved books and reading when I grew up, but I had no idea it was a career. And I had no idea you could do it. I'm from Minnesota. It was not something anyone I knew did. And I thought authors wrote books and they magically appeared in the library and in my home. And so it wasn't until way later that I learned that a bunch of people, like a ton of people work 
to make books happen and that it's a really fun and cool job. And so I'm so excited. I try as many times as I can to talk about it to younger, especially girls, <laughs> uh, to, to help spread the word because I had no idea. Yeah, I, well, I think that's such a good segue into this because you said, I don't fix commas. I actually do fix commas in my job. So there are a lot of different kinds. I mean, I fix a lot of other stuff besides commas sometimes, but um, there are a lot of different types of editors. So Stephanie, maybe it's best to start with you because you're at sort of the end of this bookmaking process among the three of you. So maybe take us from how does a book get made? Yeah. So usually, let's say you have a book idea, you talk to someone like Johanna, who she can tell you all about that process, right, of coming up with the idea. Sometimes I'm working with authors on ideas of like, they have no idea and we, we are brainstorming. But usually it's like, here's this and I have an idea of how to, to, to make it better or to like there's a, a, a group of people we think it could really target and we're starting to refine that. And, and I usually work pretty hands-on with authors. So I have them send me chapters as they write because I'm working with adult authors and adult fic, like nonfiction. So they are writing full chapters and I'm giving a lot of feedback of like, here, you know, your tone is really formal and we talked about being warm and personable, for example. Um, and then we go through a lot of revisions until we get the book right. And, and then I'm working with the rest of our team at Simon & Schuster to come up with the marketing and publicity plan and help get the word out to the wider world and help all the way through publication. So when you see someone on a TV show and they're talking about their book and holding the book up. That's that. That's part of. I'm behind the scenes working on that plan. And and working backwards, Johanna, you work with authors. Um, some of my actually not some of literally you have my most favorite off authors who you work with all the time. And tell me what that process is like. How do you find them? How do they find you? Because you need. You know, when you're in when you're playing in the big leagues like this, they, they need an agent to help get their book made, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm um well the, the interesting thing I did is that I went from being an editor to going back to agency. And uh, in this uh, like second part of my career, uh, for lack of better words, a lot of the authors I'm representing are either authors that I used to be their editor or a, a lot of authors that are recommended by other authors. But then generally, um, I also have a, a submission a, a submission inbox where writers send me samples of their work. Um, I go through it, my assistant go through it. And uh, based on the material I receive, which is normally depending on the type of book, but uh, it starts first with the first 10 pages, then uh, I request more, 50 pages or 100 or the full manuscript, it depends, on, it depends on what it is. Or if it's a nonfiction, it's a book proposal, which is shorter. It's about, I will say, it could be some, somewhere from 25 to 50 pages. And uh, based on those samples and then having an, um, an interview with the writer and we make sure we are on the same page regarding where they wanna go with their career, um, we end up working together and I'm offered representation. And when I say I offer representation, it means that I'm gonna work with them on um, having the best possible way to present their work to uh, to publishers and um, with the hope that a publisher will one publisher multiple publisher will make an offer and that's how they can start their uh, writing writing career so that's the way but i have to say that i will say like most of the authors i'm working with are recommendations either from again other authors my former authors or uh, editors too. 
And so do you, you work with people like Stephanie and say, hey, what do you think about this book? And Stephanie will say like, yeah, that's not really the direction we're going in or, oh yes, I love it. Is that the back and forth that happens? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yeah. so normally, let's say I feel I have a project that I consider ready enough to go to an editor. So then a, a, a plan is put in place where first a pitch letter is work. I, I work on a pitch letter, then I work on a list of editors that a, every editor has like the type of book they normally publish. So Part of my job is to find the best, ma the best match for the writer. Um, so let's say, for example, if uh, Stephanie has recently acquired a certain type of book and I have a similar book, um, I mean, not recently, but let's say two, three years ago, then I, I will go to Stephanie, but not just to Stephanie, but to a few editors that might be the perfect match editorially for that particular uh, uh, book. And uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so do you sometimes try to get them to bid against each other for a book? Is that why you go to more than one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that happens. That happens naturally, yes. I, I, but I have to say it's um, having been in the industry for so long, again, for me, it's very important to find the perfect match. I have been in both sides of the relationship and I know how important that is because when an author signs with an editor, I mean, they're gonna work with an editor, it's a minimum of 12, 18 months and hopefully a whole career that you're gonna be working with with someone so that uh, uh, it ha there are many components and one of them is chemistry uh, liking each other because it is a relationship like any other relationship and the same with me when I'm going to offer representation to someone I also have that interview to make sure that we are going to be um, that I feel that we will be a good match or the author feels that I will be a good match uh, for them. And that's something that people don't know much about publishing. Is this a lot about the relationship aspect of putting a book together? Because it's not the same than putting a, a other products together, or la, at least I like to think that. Uh, it is, it is um, um, putting together a book is a collaboration. Of course, the principal person is the author, but it's a collaboration with a group of people, right? So part of my job is to find the best possible match for an editor and then also the people that are gonna be working with long-term. Well, I, I wanna come back to this idea of the relationships because I think that is a really important thing. I, I, I think before this conversation, maybe a lot of people thought like, well, I have a great idea. I'm a good writer. Why wouldn't it just, happen naturally. And Jen, you know, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you started as a newspaper reporter, which is a very different kind of writing than you're doing now. For one thing, one of them is fact-based, hope, hopefully, and reality, and it's very quick and you're writing every day or maybe multiple times a day. And now you're doing something completely different. So how did you make that transition? Was that scary? Did you know where to start? How did you do that? Um, I'll take it a piece at a time. So I, you're right. There are big differences between writing for a newspaper and writing fictional novels. And the biggest one is that if you're a journalist or if you're a good journalist anyway, you will not make up a single blade of grass or a freckle on someone's nose. Like everything you write needs to be based in fact. Um, and everything I write now is completely made up. <laughs> like, I write realistic fiction, so it's plausible. Um, there's not a ton of magic or things that you wouldn't see in the real world, but it is made up. These are not real people that I'm writing about. Um, but I think one of the ways the two are very similar and one of the ways that journalism was a great preparation for me was just what you've all been talking about is that um, writing for newspaper and writing books is a very collaborative process. In a newspaper, it's sped way up, but it's still 
you're writing for an audience. You're writing to be read. You're writing to interact with someone else. You're not writing in a journal um, for yourself. That is valid too, and that's important, but it's a very different kind of writing. Um, I love the collaborative elements of this. I love being edited. That doesn't mean that it isn't hard. Um, you try not to take things personally, but it's very personal. And it's hard when someone says, you know, this thing that I love and that I've spent weeks and months um, writing that I made myself, you know, it came out of my brain for them to say, Jennifer, this is not working, I'm sorry. Like that hurts a little bit. And then, so I think you kind of like stop. You have to think all of these people are on my side. And all of them want to tell this story and want to make this story the best that it can be. And how extraordinary it is to be like a part of this team who are all trying to get this story into the world. Um, and so I think that is what makes it so magical. The fact that it's not you alone, even when the book goes out into the world, and then you have readers who are having an experience with it. And it's experience that you can't control, but that interaction is what makes it so special. So. Um, I think having come from journalism got me used to that. I'm used to, <laughs> I'm used to people. You I mean, think, you're used to critics. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that <laughs> book editors I found were far, have been far gentler in delivering their criticism <laughs> than newspaper editors, um, who will straight up in my experience say, this is just terrible. Um, I don't think I've ever had a book editor say that, but that's not, that doesn't mean that they don't um, believe as fiercely in making that book as good as it can be. It's just a different culture, perhaps. Um, so I was used to that. Um, I think another thing that the two careers have in common is just it um, is an asset to be curious and to want to find things out about the world. And so for me, even though it's a very different kind of writing, it felt like a very natural transition. So did you first have an idea for a book that you, was it like always in your brain that someday you were going to write your first book? Like in what it was? Not at all. Just like um, Stephanie was saying, I had a very similar experience where I would go to school or go to the library and there were books and I knew that someone wrote those books. But it would it never occurred to me that someone like me could write those books or that um, stories like mine were the kind of stories that are in books. Um, so it wasn't until far later that I realized that was even a possibility. And how did you do it at first when you said, yeah. OK, I want to try this? Did you practice by yourself before you did it or did you find it an agent like Johanna first or how did you do that? Yeah, all of it. I think because, um, like I said, I am someone who is naturally curious and likes to dive in and find things out and understand. Um, I tried to learn as much as I could about uh, children's publishing. So I read lots of books on the topic. I think though, if I could give any advice to someone who wants to write books is to read a lot of books. So I read um, as many books, I would go to the library and read as many books as I can, I could. Um, to get a sense of what was out there. How were people using words? What really worked? What didn't? What did I like? What didn't I like? Um, and then I started writing. And it's funny because my first, the first book I published was a picture book. And when I first wrote it, it was, it was, I'm sort of embarrassed to say in front of an agent and an editor that it was many thousand words long. <laughs> so, and then I was like, okay, this is not what picture books look like in the real world. If I want to get this published, I'm going to have to pare it way down. Um, when it came to it was, writing, it was thousands. Maybe of I words was exaggerating. It was at least two thousand. It was a long. There was a lot of dialogue, and like it was, it was a, it was a poem. Because I, I have that. Pic, I, ha, I have that book. We, we read it, the, it because it's, it's partially in Spanish and partially yeah. in English. It is not anywhere close to a thousand. No, it's under a thousand. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's under fifty. I would say. Or <laughs> That's like a, twenty. <laughs> Um, so you learn, right? You learn like that's not how picture books get made. Um, when I started writing um, novels, my first novel is called Steph Soto Taco Queen. Um, and that came from an idea that I got while being a reporter. I worked up in Stockton, California with Audrey. It's in the middle of California, not the kind of California you see on postcards or on TV. 
Um, and there were food trucks everywhere around our office and they created this like taco truck alliance. Um, and I just got really curious about what that was all about and what it was like to own a food truck business. Um, so um, I did what I always do. I read lots and lots of middle grade. Um, if you open a book, often in the back, there's a section called acknowledgements. And that's where the author thanks all of the people who helped bring this book into the world. And authors will often thank their agents. And so I would go through the books that I loved, the middle grades that were kind of like the books that I wanted to write and find agents who represented that kind of book. Um, and I found one, her name is Jennifer Loughran, and she happened to be hosting a webinar like this one, all about middle grade. And as part of that webinar, she would critique your first 500 words. Um, and so I just thought, here's someone who represents the kind of books I want to write, who has like a taste that resonates with me. Um, I think it would be very valuable for me to hear what she has to say, but also for her to put my work in front of her. Um, and so that's what happened. And based on that, she asked to see the whole manuscript. Um, and now she represents me and she's wonderful. That's awesome. Good, good research that you put into that. <laughs> So, John, like, how if if there are young women watching this now, and they say, "Well, I don't know if I'm a great writer, and I don't know if I'll be a great editor," but this agent thing that sounds pretty cool to me because I could bring the two sides together. What sort of formal education um, is required, or is there anything that's required um, to to get into being an agent? How do you do that? Um, well, I think one of the one of the, the best things to do is to try to apply for internships. Publishing is a fascinating industry, and there are many aspects of it, and many departments that you can work on. So I think one of the best things I did before starting in publishing is that I interned at an agency, I interned at Random House when it was just Random House. And it really gave me, um, gave me the opportunity to see uh, both sides of the business and see which one was more um, aligned with what I wanted to do. Uh, because, um, well, the first thing, of course, you have to love to read. It's like the number, I will say, the number one requirement is that you need to devour a uh, box and have a wide uh, taste uh, uh, for, uh, for box. That, that will be the first requirement. The next one will be apply to internships so you can um, get a sense of how the job really looks like, close, in very close. And also I will say, many professionals offer, if you reach out to them, offer to have an informational with you, which I also think it's great. There are agencies and publishers that also allow, the, have a program where you can shadow a person for a, a couple of weeks. That's an, an, another way um, to also make sure that you are getting into the into the, the right side um, uh, of the business. On the agent side, I believe that you also need to like um, business uh, because obviously an agent is representing the, the, in, the best interest of the author, but also they are managing, helping manage um, a career. So having an instinct for business is extremely important. Um, I will say, um, you also need to like to talk to people for a long time as well, because a lot of what I do <laughs> is I have, a, I talk to my authors every day about different aspects of whatever they are in, in, the, in the journey of their uh, publishing career, but I, I also normally on the phone, with the editor or the publisher. Uh, so it's important that you like to uh, talk to people uh, as well. I don't know if everybody says that, but I think it's one of the most important part of my job is that um, is to help the author navigate 
uh, the journey of becoming a writer and even after they become a writer. Um, so I will say that those are sort of the, the, uh, the requirements. Now, the interesting thing with also uh, being an agent is that you find many agents who were former lawyers, uh, doctors, uh, writers, so you name it. So the, the beauty of being an agent too is that you can come even, many people do it, do it as their next career after they have studied something completely different. That's really interesting. Is, do you find people from different careers because they also have a background in, say, copyrights or intellectual property or the contract part of it? Is that helpful? Is that is that why that's a natural path? And maybe talk a yes. little bit about what, what a copyright is for anyone who doesn't know. Oh, a, uh, a copyright is, um, is the intellectual property property of the book of the manuscript, that, that's what it is. And it's regis registered under the, the, the name of the author. But and yes, so I, guess, that, I, 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 I guess, yes. So honestly, I have never thought about that, that why lawyers become agents, but a, a lot of them do. And uh, of course, when you are an agent also, you are reviewing contracts and negotiating clauses. So of course, if you're a lawyer, it comes really, um, really hand, handy. I happen to love contracts. That's apparently a weird thing um, that I like. <laughs> and I'm married to a lawyer too. <laughs> oh, that's very convenient. <laughs> yeah, very, very convenient. Uh, but but yes, of course, if you're a lawyer, it comes re in really handy when you're negotiating a contract. Yeah. Stephanie, did you want to jump in there? Oh, I was going to add that the lawyers tend to be pretty skilled at negotiating. And I think that that's, that's a really big skill as an agent and probably also an editor. So if, if you can think about like, if Jennifer's writing the book and Johanna's representing her and Johanna's coming to me to sell the book and I'm, I'm interested and my team loves it, you know, we're making an offer for money <laughs> to publish that book. And, and Johanna is getting other Stephanie's, other editors offering also. So we're negotiating and then let's say I win the book and, and sometimes it's not because I'm paying the most money. Like Johanna said, the relationships and chemistry are also important. Um, and, but we're gonna start negotiating the, the contract and the, there are different points that you can, be involved, which are include uh, the rights to a book, which I don't want to get too in the weeds for everyone, but I think it's important in terms of there are many different jobs in publishing. And one of them is, is you like as an editor, I can try to buy world rights or North American rights. So I can only publish that book in North America or world English. I can publish that book only in English but around the world. If I have world rights, I have all languages and I can sell like my sub right, my rights department can sell those rights. So, you know, the French language to a French publisher or Johanna is going to try to keep those rights and have her and her team sell them. So there are different, different besides the, 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 author, the editor, the agent, there are a lot of people behind the scenes making these books happen, including rights and sales and marketing and publicity, cover and those art. Cover art, yeah, that's very, that, that is a really interesting topic. We'll get there too, but um, the rights, does that also include the rights? Like there are a lot of movies that were originally books like you always hear the book is better than the movie you should read the book first is that also negotiated in these contracts uh yes they're almost always held on to by the agent and and then that is like an exciting extra um perk is that when the film rights are sold and hollywood actually goes through with it like that can be a really amazing uh extra life for a book right think of how many books that you've loved and then the movie comes out but also that you discover because this movie comes out and you're like wait i'm gonna read that book 
right. And we have two questions from Linda Jew that have come in and I, I think it might be good for, for you to take these um, possibly together. Can kids have their book published? And how long does it take from beginning to end? So let's take the first one. Um, do, is there an age limit for how old you have to be? Um, I, I, can take, I, I, I can take that. I can take that. I have a represented, I'm actually I'm representing uh, under, under age kids. They normally need, they need the permission of a guardian and the legal guardian has to um, approve and be, they also co-sign the contract with their legal guardian, but it, it can definitely, it can definitely happen. And how long does it take from beginning to end? Jen, like when you first had your first draft, let's say from your first draft to the day that you got the box of Step Soto Taco Queen, how long was that whole process? It takes so long. <laughs> let's see. Um, I would say at least 18 to 24 months, maybe. And then if it's a book that has a lot of art in it, like a chapter book or a picture book that's heavily illustrated, much longer. Um, I'm trying to think. I have book that I turned in that means it's already gone through multiple rounds of revision um in January of last year and it will be published in April of 22 so that seems pretty fast um mostly it takes longer in my experience if things can be faster if there's a reason like in the news like if there's a biography of someone like um there is a recent picture book biography of Dr. Fauci and that one went like put on a really accelerated schedule to get it out in time. Right. How long, or how do you know when you have a first draft that's ready to show someone? That is a tough question. I feel like um, I'm a pretty slow writer and um, I have several drafts. And I'm an outliner, so I feel like that's part of the writing process too, even though it doesn't really feel like you're writing the book. Um, Wait, so before we go on, because we are talking about this in my household right now with essay ah. writing. When you say it, outlining is important, so what you say you're an outliner, so even after several books and a newspaper career, you still come up with an outline of what you want your book to be? In when I was a reporter, I would go interview someone. And then when I was driving back in my head, I would be thinking about what's the first paragraph, what's the comes next, what comes that like, that's how my brain works. Um, to help call out, not everyone's brain works that way, but I know that about myself. I know that I cannot write a second sentence until I've written a first sentence. And so I, it's incredibly difficult for me to write anything without an outline first. And if you bear with me, I'll show you something because it happens to be right here. Um, this is like a scene by scene outline of a book I'm working on right now. All the scenes are on post-its. Um, so that works for me. That's my process. Wait, wait, bring that back. Bring that back. <laughs> it's not very wait, fancy. Wait, wait. No, but do the different colors mean something? Yeah, um, some of them are because I ran out of green, but some of them are turning points. <laughs> They're like important moments or things that ha something has to happen then. Um, and so how long will this, story. how long will that book be with all those post-its? That Is should that a be book? like, no, that one, I would think it's middle grade. So maybe 37,000 to 40,000 words. Wow. Um, that's really awesome. Done. So anyway, I do multiple drafts before I show anyone. And then I tried to become very disciplined about setting it aside for at least a couple of weeks. This is hard because once you finish a draft that you think is good, you want to like get it moving. Um, but every single time I set it aside and open it up again, I find things, not just mistakes, but like structural things or things that are not as like, oh, I thought that was really great, but it's really not. And it needs a little bit more work. Um, so I think being able to set something aside, work on something else, clear your brain and come back to it with fresh perspective helps a ton. Stephanie, I saw you nodding the whole time when it was like, yes, I want an outline. Is that what you recommend? Too? Yeah, 
it's that's it's kind of wild, right? That I'm working with eighty thousand to a hundred thousand words, and uh, Johanna made a good point earlier that fiction you usually have a full novel that you have ready to share with your agent, and nonfiction is just a proposal. So it's usually the proposal I'm getting from from an agent or potential author is the idea, the outline like who is this person, what the marketing publicity is, and then usually like a sample chapter or two, but it's not written yet. And so when I'm signing it up, I like, it's kind of scary, but I like it because what Jennifer said earlier is that the advantage is you get to be part of the collaborative process. So if my authors are up for it, we do high school like outlines with you know thesis statements and it's 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 hard to write out the problems and where you're going if you don't know so it really helps is just a guide that isn't written in cement as you can see from the post-it note notebook <laughs> that you can move things around and make those decisions but you have a guide to help decide like oh do I do I want to move that? Is that worth it? And it just makes that when you send in the full manuscript to your editor, one, I've already been reading chapters and giving you feedback, but it just makes it a lot less scary. And it usually makes the process of us editing much easier. And, you know, it, it isn't that we don't go through big edits, but it's not, you know, hair pulling out tears like, oh, this is in trouble. You know, we've really like figured out some of the bigger picture stuff at the beginning. Well, this is this is why I love this topic is I think most people assume that writing is easy for people who do it for a living or editing is easy for people who do it for a living, but it's still a lot of work to get to that final product that you don't, that you don't really see. So maybe we can go to, um, the, the actual craft of how you do this. So Jen, you have a lot of different characters in your books. How do you come up with who these people are? Like you're making something up from scratch. How do you do that? Do you, do you come up with an idea of it and outline it, outline their character first, or does it develop as you're putting your post-it notes on the page? Yeah, a little of sort of a combination of all of those things. I was trying to think about that um, before the webinar about you know where things started. Um, and so, as I said earlier, I write contemporary realistic fiction. That means it's fiction, but it's set in the now times, and it's about things that could really happen. Um, and so, I think for the like most often my ideas come from situations and then I think about like who would be the most compelling character to put in that situation um, because at least in middle grade you want to show someone um, whose world is becoming bigger and what you know how they change over the course of this novel um, and so you have to put them through some hard times and challenge them in ways and so starting with a situation um, kind of sometimes lends itself to the character. Um, none of my characters are based on me and none are based on people I know, but they certainly borrow little bits of me and borrow bits of people that I know. Um, I would say that if there's a thread that connects them, um, I'm interested in like quiet kinds of courage because um, I'm a quiet person. Um, I was very shy growing up and um, books and reading were a way for me to kind of um, share my ideas and share my thoughts in a way that I felt confident doing that. So I'm interested in that kind of quiet courage and I'm really interested in like creativity where you didn't expect to find it. So in Steph Soto Taco Queen, um, the main character Steph has a dad who owns this food truck and he demonstrates creativity um, with his recipes. And I have a chapter book series coming out that involves um, like a magical sewing kit. And we don't often think about sewing um, and craftiness necessarily as creativity, um, but it really is. And so um, that's been fun to explore. I also love to 
infuse my books with my own culture. I am Mexican American. Um, and to bring us back to the beginning of this conversation, um, I, not until I was maybe a senior in high school, did I read any books that had um, characters um, from Mexican American families who like spoke like me or um, had experiences like me or had a culture that resonated with me. And so it's really important to me now to write about those experiences so that other readers can say, yes, our stories are the kinds of stories you find in books. Well, you, I mentioned at the beginning, um, the first, well, maybe it wasn't your first book, but, but maybe, maybe you have to tell book. me. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, and it was, it's part in Spanish and, and, and then it's has the English on the other page. Was that something that you came up with on your own? And why did you decide to do that? You know what? I didn't. Um, that was a decision that the publisher made. Um, which meant that I had to make the book even shorter, which was um, a heartbreaker at the time, but I'm so glad we did. It means the world to me that that book is in side-by-side -side English and Spanish, because I think that means, um, you know, just like it tells you, it sends a message if you're reading about um, your own culture in a book or you're getting to share your culture through a book that that culture has value and those experiences are important. And I think it's the same with language. So um, I feel really, really privileged that um, two of my books have been translated into Spanish and one into Korean. Um, and I love that readers can see their language and know that that is the language of literature. Johanna, you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that you're from Ecuador originally, and I know it's also really important to you to represent a range of um, authors from different backgrounds too. Can you talk a little bit about why that is a passion of yours and why that's so critical to have in the publishing industry? Yes, I think, I mean, that's, I have a dedicated my career to uh, first publish di diverse voices and now as an agent 80% uh, of my list uh, of my clients are uh, also di diverse authors um, I think it's important that uh, especially children that they see themselves a uh, portrait in in books I believe um, I like to see my I'm an, an immigrant so for me personally it's important to see my story reflected on the pages um, and that people can um, uh, find books written by different different perspectives than, um, than the perspectives that are normally published. I think it's um, important that it's a lot to say, a lot of things to dismantle. Um, um, and therefore, the, there is also a lot of opportunities that need to be given to uh, di diverse writers in general. Stephanie, I, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but can you also talk about this? I feel like the whole, you know, thankfully our whole country is starting to wake up to systematic racism and to the need to lift up a variety of voices. There's also a commercial component to this too, where you're trying to decide if something's going to sell. So is that a false, is that a, is that a thing that used to be um, taken in consideration that's being viewed differently now? That's a good question. So I think publishing relies a lot on what is called, are called comp books, which are just competitive books, right? So it's like, when Johanna is going out with a new book, she might say, this is, this book meets this book, right? And I, as an editor, because it it's an interesting field because it's both very creative, but it also is a business. And so we're talking about making it advance against royalties of a certain amount of money that then if if the book doesn't sell enough, it doesn't it, the company, the publisher loses money on. And so we're, we're often looking at what other books have sold that are like this book. And I think that's problematic to a point, right? Because we're always looking backwards and we're always relying on 
here's what has worked before. And then you sort you, I like looking for books that are sort of complex, right? I, I actually had left publishing briefly and worked at a startup much before any, um, when people still really loved tech and before anything with me too. And I think they didn't go through anything horrific at a startup, but I had a lot of women telling me stories and I came back to book publishing and decided, I thought I had my least commercial book idea ever to do a book about sexism and tech and how it was this very seemingly progressive industry that had some pretty traditional views of women and people of color and it, it, it yeah, and, and looked for the author and went out and found this and it's actually, it's sold really amazingly um, despite the odds, right? And, and so you have to sometimes like look for books that haven't been done before. And so, but it is still like that strange, catch like if you're if you've only if you've mostly published books by like older white men <laughs> and you're looking to publish other books like it the author isn't everything but it is also I think a problematic part of the industry. Johanna how do you pitch books like that that maybe um, don't have you know something to compare it to but that you think are really really great is that a difficult thing to come up with the the way to to get somebody to take a chance on it um well i will um it, it look it's always a challenge selling books is not easy either right but um the the way how i approach publishing in general and this is why i still look I don't look. I don't look eighty or ninety or one hundred. <laughs> it's because you. I really believe in the power of a book and what a book can do to a person, right? And th so for me, that's like what moves me and why I do what I do. Uh, so say by by saying that is normally when when I um uh, and again as I said um. 80% of my uh, authors are BIPOC authors. So normally uh, on the pitch letter, I explain why it's important to publish this book, why this per perspective is important and, or just say this has never been done and this is probably why and you should, you should, um, you should read this. Now I, I have to say that being for so many years in the industry, uh, there is some positive change happening in, in this direction, particularly on the children's side. You, you can see there is a real interest in making a difference and uh, publishing more and more books uh, by BIPOC authors, diverse voices. Uh, and on the adult side, there's a lot more work to do. Uh, but it's, it's sort of, um, it's a very complex subject because it's not just the books that are offered or the, or the authors that get representation, uh, but it, it is also within the publishing houses who make decisions, who are, who are receiving these stories. And I'm not just talking about editorial, but at, at the other departments, because you can get an editor to buy a book, but then that editor becomes the advocate of that book in-house, the public in-house, and that editor goes and sells it in-house to the to the sales department, to the marketing department. Actually, within their same imprint, they have to sell it first and get and get people behind it, right? So even from the people who work at publishing houses, that's the first place where things need to get better. But the good news is that there is an intention to do it. Um, so we'll see if, uh, and, I, and again, I don't think it only needs to be editorial, it's, it needs to be the different departments and then who is making the decision, who decides what to buy and what, oh, sorry, uh, what to buy and what to publish. And uh, I think it's a complex, it's a complex 
uh, situation, but the good thing is people are trying to make it better. And that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I think I'm learning a lot in this conversation is it sounds like you have to be a really persuasive person um, to get your book made, to get your book published, to get um, resources once you've, you've signed on to be the editor of a book, to get resources for it. Um, can, can we talk a little bit about the covers of books? Because um, I, I don't know about you, you can probably see some of my books. Maybe, well, no, it's all blurry. You can't see my books. I, I am one of those people that takes the covers off my books. Um, I know I don't, I, I, I don't do that. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> what, but a lot of thought goes into what a cover looks like. Um, can one of you talk about that whole process of, of how you get what it looks, how these words become a cover? I, Jennifer, do you like your covers? <laughs> I love no. my covers. <laughs> if you um, like I your do. covers, maybe you I could talk about it. I really do. Um, I, I think that Stephanie probably has the best perspective by the time it gets to me. I do get to weigh in on sketches and general direction, but I am in general very happy to leave that to an art director who is an expert in covers. Um, and yeah, I think that's one of the, you know, again, to come back to the collaboration is you have this like team of professionals who are experts at making books and um, an art director and cover design is just one of those areas. Yeah, so Definitely on my team- I surprised it, when you said that. <laughs> I, I, you look surprised when Jennifer said, I, I'm good with almost anything. Are most authors pretty opinionated? Yeah, I would say, I mean, partly if you think about it, the like, John and I and the the people at Simon and Schuster at your publisher are part of your process, but a book is the author's. So my approach to covers is usually I like I'm talking to the author first and foremost. We have to come up with a subtitle, which is its own exciting process. And then once you have that, you're talking about like what are what are the, what is sort of the mood of this? What is the, the aesthetic we're going for? What is on the same bookshelf? Like if, you know, virtually and in a bookstore or in like, like what, what sits alongside? Do we want to look anything like this? Do we not want to? What, you know, and every author sort of approaches it differently. Some have given me mood boards. Some are like, I definitely don't want this color or I love abstract art and want to go for something like this. And what I really love about this is we, we then internally meet as a team with our publisher and the publicity director and marketing and the art director and the art team. So there's a, there are designers and are talking about the book and give them the book to read, but we're giving them sort of the highlights and also some direction. So if you're talking about uh, a romance novel, you're that's very different than a hard hitting political book, right? So you're talking sort of a, about- Hopefully those are two thing. separate things. The hard hitting romance and the political books are hopefully separate, but maybe yeah, not. I, I didn't actually may well we just well no not romance. I was like we just published Hillary Clinton's first novel, but that's not romance. Okay. <laughs> it's a hard hitting political novel. <laughs> um, so and then and then the the like really magical thing is that the art director goes and with designers comes up with like pretty incredible designs and a bunch of different directions that we then get to see internally and discuss and then decide which ones to send the author. And, and then the author is like, I hate these all, I love these all, or this one, you know, whatever it might be. Do you ever test them in the market and like see what people would gravitate to before you pick one? Sometimes. I can share that I had a cover change so that it would um, work better in the, the the book club flyers that kids get um, because oh. the hardcover um, cover um, 
was like a little bit subdued and they wanted something that would really stand out in those book club flyers. So we are almost, almost out of time. Um, we have three minutes left, which is the perfect amount of time. I could, I could ask you, I think I might afterwards because I'm lucky enough to have your email addresses ask you questions forever. Um, I thought maybe I would ask you what your favorite book is, but I'm going to change my mind because I think you all might have to put, pick your own clients or your own book. So instead, I will, I will let you not answer that one and say, what if you could go back to the beginning of your publishing career and give yourself a piece of advice or a piece of advice that you got from somebody else that was really great, what would you tell littler you, younger you? So I'm going to start with you, Jennifer. What would you tell yourself if you could? Um, I, yeah, to come back to, we've talked so much about relationships. Um, and Audrey, you know, because journalism is the same way. You will run into the same people over and over and over in ways that you did not expect. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to be friends with everyone, but it should make you think about how, you know, to, to work professionally with people. Um, and so some great advice that I received that I, I would love to pass on is to think about the people you create with, um, fellow writers, if you're a writer or editors, if, as if you're an editor or agents, if you wanna go into agenting as your colleagues and not your competition. It's much more fun and much more rewarding to cheer one another on and help one another out. So everyone shines than to try to cut each other down. That is such good advice. I still give people that advice, even, you know, among adults that I work with and mentor now. It's not good to burn bridges. It's always better to be nice to people. Um, Stephanie, what would you tell young Stephanie if you could? That's a good question. I, I think, um, well, one, I like Jennifer's because that's definitely my approach to this. But I think thinking about, um, the reason I got into this is partly, you know, being a book nerd, but also really believing in the power of books as this pretty magical moment, first alone with Jennifer, right, with the author, but really having that private moment where my heart and mind has been changed because of a good book. And that's a, that, that's, kind of a rare experience, especially today, right? And that, and really believing in that power is how I got into what I'm doing, but really believing in my, like that instinct and the instincts I was feeling and like what, what I was, like part of my job is to be like, is this book something other people want to read? And, re and I, you know, like Lucille Clifton's poetry, like I like some like you know, I think her best-selling book is, has not sold many copies, right? But like, it's really moving and powerful. And so I think for a while, I like didn't trust my own instincts and was trying to sort of figure out what other people, and I like doing research and data, but I think that the, like combining those and trusting it earlier is probably the advice I'd give to my younger self. And Johanna, last but definitely not least, what would what advice would you give yourself? Well, you, it's, uh, when you thank you for that question, when you asked the question, two things came to mind. So I want to be honest. The first one <laughs> was be patient with yourself because building a career takes time, and so that's the first thing that came to mind. Uh, and so be patient, number one enjoy the process of building that of going through that journey of building a career and the second thing that crossed my mind was to find mentors when you're young and i think it took me a while to purposely look for mentors of course i was blessed to have people come into my life but i think a the mentors later in my career are people that I reach out to. Um, and I, that's something that I wish I had done when I was younger. And I, I don't know about you, but I feel like the older I get, the more mentors I need too. So having a good yes. steady supply of people to help is always a good idea. 
Um, ladies, thank you so much. I am now inspired to go drop off this call and go read something now. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everybody who's listening um, and, and viewing us afterwards. I hope you realize that there are lots of careers in publishing that you can take. And uh, you all are a true inspiration. I wish you the best of luck with everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.